We arrived in Leicester. We came down to meet a guy named Stephen who was coming to get his first chip implanted. He was going to get it done by biohacker and tattoo artist, Genova Rain. Good to meet you. Nice to see you. How are you? I'm not bad, how are you? You're good, how was your trip? Um, it was all right. It thanks. Very long. thanks for coming and meeting us. I appreciate it. What have you come for? I've come to get a microchip implanted into my hand. And why? Well, there's lots of reasons why. Um, the, the main reason, I guess, is to evolve with the world. Yeah. To, talk to me about transhumanism. Um, I like the idea of transhumanism because um, transhumanism is the idea that you can evolve and you can engineer your way into the future, I guess. You know, if, if I want to develop my own tech, then why not develop my own tech that can respond to my biology? What's this going to do that you're getting on today? Log me into my computer, um, open locks for me, uh, open my front door, uh, I can open my car and things like that. Um, hopefully in the future I'll be able to pay for things. I wouldn't see it as me trying to make myself better. I don't mind being biological, you know, but um, if I can be part mechanical, I just think that's so, so much more awesome. You know, look at look how many people die of horrific disease every year, and yet they pray every day. Mm. It is, it's just no use, you know, but we have created medicine. We can engineer our way out of our problems. You're quite passionate about that. Extremely passionate. Absolutely. You're quite passionate about this, aren't you? Yeah. So is this the beginning for you of... Is today like your technological baptism? <laughs> that is a fantastic way to put it. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is like the step that I can take. Into? The future. Stephen's views in upgrading himself were intriguing and the time had come for him to get his first chip implanted by Genova Rain. Time to get chip. She yeah. did all of her right. procedures from a small studio above a post office. This is, this is how we are making ourselves human plus, is what we call it. We're better than being human. We're, we're advancing ourselves to have more than what we were born with, more than what we were given with. We can do more than what we're currently capable of. So just relax your breathing. A nice big breath in. Amazing. Cool, that is one. Did you feel much of that? I did feel that. Um, it's a fair little pinch there. Okay, I so you did not react at all. No, no. <laughs> Amazing. It, wasn't, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> Before I was a transhumanist in theory, but now I'm a transhumanist in practice. Mm. I really have done it now, taken that first step. More people came to get chipped throughout the day, one of whom was Winter. Her reasons for believing in transhumanism were more out of necessity than desire. Well, the first uh, cyber enhancements I had weren't voluntary. They were through the hospital because I was in a very bad car accident that fractured my back in multiple places, both my ankles and both my knees. I have in my left hand an RFID chip, that's my door key. In my right hand, I have an NFC chip that is my business card. In the middle of my right finger, I have a magnet that lets me sense EM fields. I have the contraceptive implant, a 3D printed kneecap, and now two LED implants. If I travel, um, I have a near autoimmune disease, so I'm allergic to the world and everything in it. You know, fruit, veg, grass, pollen. Somebody sneezes in China, I'm gonna get sick. Like, it's, I have the worst immune system. And I've had a lot of medical procedures. It's just proactive versus reactive. Mm -hmm. Instead of waiting until I'm hurt, and then getting something medically done to me. I can do something that stops me from getting hurt in the first place. Say I'm surfing off the coast of Spain, and I trip and fall and smack my head in the water, and I'm knocked out. While the paramedics can get me, I could be completely knocked out and unconscious. They don't know anything about me. They don't know my name. They don't know my blood type. None of that. Well, I've got a medical ID bracelet that I wear that says Medical Implant NFC Scan Finger Webbing. They can tap my hand then to that, and it'll pop up with a web page I've made that has all of my medical history and my doctor's name if they need to talk to it. So say I go coma, it's also got a link to my will on there. You know, it's got everything in there. So I'm not, oh, Jane Doe in some hospital. It has all of this stuff. A few minutes. After a busy day of chipping her clients, I finally had the chance to catch up with Genova Rain. Yeah. What chips do you have? Literally none. You've got none? How well, controversial is that? That's very interesting. <laughs> is it not? Why? I kind of kept it that way to make it interesting. <laughs> There's so... 
the functionality that we have right now. It's for passwords and keys and starting your car and uh, entry into your house or entry into your workplace. My workplace is here. We can't fit an RFID locked downstairs. I know, but it's quite interesting that you're pr you, you are promoting it yes. in a manner, yeah. yet you don't have them yourself. For me, totally useless. So we've worked out you're the chipper and not the chippy then. I'm the biohacker and not the biohacky. That's the one, yeah, yeah. But do you think there needs to be more regulation for this? Definitely, yes. As far as I know, there's currently very little specific uh, bylaws for this at all. For example, if you're... Um, if you read through any of the tattoo and piercing bylaws online, they are talking about sharps, they're talking about waste disposal, all of which is exactly relevant to this, but at no point in that is the term biohacking actually specifically mentioned. So I would imagine at some point there'll be an update to that specific legislation simply just to include that term, because everything else for this is already re relevant for piercing, tattooing, needles, waste disposal. Yeah. Is, is there more and more people now kind of... Oh. oh, definitely. Definitely. I started this about seven or eight years ago. Um, it was just basic microchips back then. Not a huge amount of functionality, but it was more for people who just wanted to be a bit cool, a bit original, yeah. have something different. Um, now that there is more functionality, definitely seen an increase. And I do have to definitely give my respect for, for anyone that has done this on themselves especially in the lead up to where we are now because they were the pioneers and without people having any interest in doing this on themselves in the first place i probably wouldn't have this as my job right now at all but doctors would shoot you down for that yes and quite rightly some would say i guess so yes who's the greatest person then that's done that Probably the most well-known person for having uh, experimented on themselves is uh, Left Anonym, for sure. We travelled to Birmingham to meet biohacking cult hero Left Anonym. Left started off experimenting with smaller items such as chips in her hands, but has become a human test subject. She currently has a huge data storage prototype device in her arm. It sounds a lot more painful than it actually Yeah, but is. I mean, a lot of people don't have drawers full of this in oh, their no. house. Like, my mum had like a celebration box that was actually medicine supplies. Yeah, yeah. But this is a drawer full of... This is a drawer full was... of actual... Oh, this is lidocaine. Well, actually, this is xylocaine, but it, it's, it's anaesthetic. And they're like, this is liquid gold as far as I'm concerned, because this was almost impossible to get in the UK for a long time. And a, a, a big old vial of it like that is enough for a huge procedure. Like, that's... That's that's all I'll need for a long time. Where did you get that from? Uh, uh various places. Are you allowed that? Um, I don't know. Probably not. But if you don't feel comfortable on that answer your question, you don't have to. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I probably shouldn't say where I got it from, but it is useful to have it. So, I think if if I was really bothered about you know pain and risk to myself and stuff and if, if that was my first concern then I wouldn't ever have done any of this shit in the first place. The, the first time I ever did an, an operation in, in 2006 it did get super infected. But I'm just a widow that does experiments by themselves. Yeah but you say that but you're someone who's um, kind of encouraged a lot of other people. I, I hope so yeah. Like, like I said when I started... Some people might say that's not a good thing. Some people might, some people might not. I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure myself whether it's a good thing or not. But I, as far as I'm concerned, knowledge should be spread to as many people as possible. Like I, I, I believe in information freedom, and, and I also believe in bodily autonomy. I, I believe that everyone has the right to try and do whatever they want with their own body, so long as it harms no one else. Do you ever feel like maybe because you're so willing to go through with stuff on yourself, you might be taking advantage of a little bit? I don't think so. Like in, in general, we're all very. Uh, what's the word, cooperative. Mm -hmm. So everyone more or less knows what everyone else is doing, everyone sort of tends to work together. So like, I, I don't feel like there would be anyone in the community that would take advantage. Does, does that make sense? Left's boyfriend Paul was also present. He and Left became an item whilst he was making a documentary about her. But what did he think about Left's biohacking ways and how concerned was he when it came to Left's experiments? Can I, do you ever worry? Yeah. yeah, there's always going to be risks involved uh, and generally I'm okay with it because a lot of the time sometimes 
I'm there and I can, she's with uh, biohackers who have medical knowledge and there is safety in place. It's never a case of, okay, people, let's turn this into a party, scalpels out, everyone hack away. Oh, the thing in her arm was very scary. Do you ever worry the day it will go too far? Of course. Uh, and, and I have said, you know, you've got to be careful with this stuff. And when I do hear about the next big project, I think, how can that go bad? It is an amateur scene, but there is science and medicine behind it. My time with Left had come to an end, and my eyes had been opened to a hidden world that is available at a click of a button. But many questions still remain unanswered about the big, unregulated grey area that is transhumanism. Wow. Yeah, pretty eye-opening stuff there. Um, well, here to talk more about the world of transhumanism uh, are Louise Blaine, a technology journalist, uh, Dr Mary Neal, lecturer in law and ethics at Strathclyde University, and Rafe Johnson, a product designer. Thanks very much for coming in, everyone, tonight. Um, I don't think it's any secret to say there was a few, a few eyebrows being raised over the course of that film there. Louise, to you first, what was your reaction to seeing that? It just it feels very extreme, so extreme. You know, I'm actually very pro in the future regulating this, you know, like Genova said, completely regulating it, making it official and implanting, because it's the way things are going. But certainly seeing such scars and seeing such extremism in that way is really quite surprising. And Mary, just your initial reaction? Uh, very similar. I mean, my field is medical and ethics. It's all about regulation. It's all about how um, these kinds of procedures, procedures that invade the body, have to be very closely controlled. Um, so to see someone um, playing fast and loose with, with their body in this way is, is quite uh, is quite alarming. But if you're some in some ways involved in this world in the sense you're maybe at the other end of transhumanism, you've um, made a, a bionic arm. Um, uh, Not quite a bionic no, arm. Sorry, no. just explain then what it is you've done. Uh, so it's basically a prototype that could um, allow you to visualise what a bionic arm would look like and then allow you to customise that. So. A look into the future of that world. Basically. Of course, yeah. So uh, to many people, these kind of technologies might seem futuristic, but I mean, I suppose how far are we down that in terms of technological advances and how far away are we from all perhaps walking around with microchips in us, do you think? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, do you think how far advanced is this technology yeah. as you see it? So it's probably more advanced than you'd realise. So there's uh, bionic arms that you can control with brain implants into your, directly into your brain. So you can control a bionic arm across the other end of the room um, through an implant, which is interesting. However, there's a lot of ethics concerns with people walking around with bionic arms and this kind of stuff. So it's really hard to say, but I think it's probably quite yeah. a quite Yeah, a it, it is a lot wider than that, isn't it? I mean, I'm kind of a bit alarmed that people are at home using this stuff. I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but you can buy this stuff on websites, can't you? You can buy things that in, insert a chip into your arm, you can buy a weapons grade scalpel, you can buy the rubber gloves, you can buy them anywhere, but people are doing this stuff. Where, what else are they doing? Where are we going with all this? I think the thing is, in, in terms of the RFID, we talk about that a little bit, so it's radio frequency identification, that's what people are putting into themselves, and NFC chips, which are actually what you've got in the back of your phone. So when you use your smartphone to pay, you use an NFC chip and you scan it. Now, putting those inside yourself, it actually sounds quite useful, right? The, you know, we saw in the piece that um, people can travel, you can scan an RFID chip and you'll get in information as to someone's medical records. I mean, you'd, you wouldn't need a, you'd go into a hotel maybe and you'd scan your hand and that would be you in. And there's a lot of pro, there's a lot of good uses for this and interesting smart uses for it but again the sort of ethical concerns as to tracking of these things the, the steps are being taken, smart assistants are coming, we're wearing them, we're putting them in glasses so the next step is for them to go inside but it's how to regulate those. Yeah I mean you know you touched on it there and obviously this is your specific field Mary, um, I suppose there's two different questions here, it's can we do it and then should we do it, I mean yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Well, obviously we can do it and people are doing it and I think we, we have to be realistic about that. It's happening. Um, so the question, your second question, I think, becomes the pertinent one. What, what, sh what regulation should be in place? Um, what questions should we be asking and what kind of conversations should we be having around these um, technologies? Um, because I think experience teaches us that once technology is out of the bag, it quickly expands and develops and it quickly becomes mainstream. Um, so I would expect that before long you will have the big tech companies becoming involved in this and producing um, products for people. Um, and I think that we can't hold back the, the tide of technological progress and, and demand 
that, that will be there for these kinds of things. So I think what we, we desperately need to do is to open up a conversation, which we're doing obviously now, um, but, about but the does it need, of it. But does it need legislation, do you think? Do you think we're, this is so far ahead of us? Does mm -hmm. it need laws? Well, it needs regulation, and that doesn't necessarily mean legislation. Um, and I suppose it depends who's going to be um, policing these technologies. Um, is it going to be the healthcare professions? Uh, it, if so, if it becomes part of, of medicine, if it becomes part of healthcare, then professional bodies might um, start regulating it. Um, it could be legislation, it could be the state. Um, the state already regulates our bodies in all sorts of ways. And one of the contributors to your film was talking about bodily autonomy and that she believed that we all have this um, absolute right to do whatever we want with our own bodies. And that's just not the case. Um, it's not the case in, in other contexts. And I, I doubt very much whether it would be accepted to be the case in this context either. Rafe, I mean, you're a product designer. Technology is your business. Do you have any concerns watching that film and, and kind of seeing um, the sort of some, some lengths that people are deciding to go to to advance technology as they see it? Yeah, my main concern around it is that a lot, from the sounds of it and from the looks of it, these people aren't necessarily trained in the medical world. So there's a lot of dangers around health around that. So I guess that'd be my main concern. But in terms of the sort of progress from a, a technological standpoint, do you see? Um, do the benefits, I suppose, outweigh the, the sort of um, the, the, the kind of the concerns? I think there's always a benefit in exploring things, and you can, from exploring, realise that things should be stopped, and you shouldn't continue going down that route. So I don't know enough about what they're doing to really have a good standpoint on that. But I do think that exploring generally is a wise thing to do because you can make really interesting discoveries from that. So, so Louise, then the, the worry is what we've got people all over the world way ahead of any legislation and way ahead of any lawmakers and they're buying stuff yeah. and sticking it in their bodies. And you talked about chips. I think Laura was in Sweden and yeah. people, people just swiping with chips in their yeah, fingers I mean, it when seemed you, you when the I, check out. Yeah, it seemed very much, um, although there was still a minority of people doing it, it felt very much above board and just part of, um, you know, Swedes embracing technological advances. Um, it, it didn't have a sort of um, underground feel to it in any way. Well, I think what's changed over the past few years is you don't hand over a card anymore, you don't put a chip and pin anymore, you just swipe your phone past or your watch past. And I think the next stage of that is absolutely, I definitely, if it was above board, if it was with one of the big manufacturers, maybe Google or Amazon or Apple, if they were doing it, I would absolutely go to a medical professional and have that and I would swipe me through. So there's no ethical concerns from your perspective then? There's definitely ethical concerns. I wouldn't say everyone should be able to do it, but I do think that we already place a lot of our, you know, a lot of our trust in technology companies. Our phones know where we are all the time. So I think those same concerns go forward into what goes inside. Mary's got a look in her face. Oh, no, I'm, I just, it's, the ethical concerns um, immediately um, alerts me. And, and I think it's far too early to see whether benefits outweigh uh, risks or vice versa. But I think certainly the things, I think it's important to have the conversation open and for ethical considerations to be a big part of that conversation. Um, and the ethical considerations that I would like to see at the forefront of the discussion going forward around these technologies would be things like, um, th what are the limits of bodily autonomy um, in this context? What are, and you talked about big tech companies and products, what about equality? Um, what about the fact that of access to these things, if we decide that these are good things, they're likely to be very expensive things once people like Apple and Google get their hands on them. Um, is, there going to, is it going to widen the gap between haves and have-nots? Um, are, are the wealthy going to become increasingly enhanced um, and, and the non-wealthy be um, increasingly disadvantaged? And these are some of the ethical concerns that I think we need to explore. Well, obviously, I mean, the Scottish government are saying they're kind of going to be consulting yeah. on the sort of the safety aspect of it. Um, but I suppose, Rafe, I mean, what do you make of, of people doing it, I suppose, in, in their own settings and, and in their own homes? Do you think that that, 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 is, that is a concern? Yeah, yeah, I'd say it's a concern. Um, it's a tricky one because she made a really good point about having the freedom to do with what you want with your own body. And to an extent, I agree, but it does fall into those realms of really... That's yeah. concerning. So before we go, you'd all have it done, though, would you? I would. No. I would be cautious. <laughs> would you, Rafe? I can't say I would. No. Oh, absolutely. Ah, there's always one. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Louise. really, really Louise. interesting discussion yeah. and a really interesting film with some incredible access there. So thank you to all the contributors and to uh, yourselves for coming in to talk about this tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Don't know if we would. Oh, I have no. my concerns. <laughs> coming up on tonight's program.